Augustine Farnola. Um, and this meeting, as you will see now, it will be recorded. So in case you don't want you, um, your video to be recorded, please turn it off. Um, because it will be put online afterwards. So today we are with Augustine Farnola. He is an international postgraduate student from Nigeria. And uh, he has featured in various international events, such as the All African People's Conference in the University of Ghana. Um, he's also the founder of AfroThinkItRight.com. It's a website you can, find it, you can uh, visit it. Um, it's a platform for young, uh, talented writers. Um, he's also a member of Lagos Studies Association in Nigeria, as well as the Institute of African Diaspora Studies um, at, at the University of Lagos, Nigeria, and the University of West Indies in Jamaica. So before he began his doctoral studies at the Department of English Literature here at Birmingham, he was a lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at the Dominican University in Ibadan, Nigeria. And here at the University of Birmingham, uh, his PhD research is focusing on post-phenomenological analysis of technological tools used for textual visualization and formalization of literary works. So this is also what we will look at today. So this is, for example, literary works such as novels, poems. Um, his most read publication is Human Conversation and the Evolution of Ethics in uh, Kirch, Kitcher's Pragmatic Naturalism um, in the Ethics of Subjectivity um, by Palgrave Macmillan. So feel free to look up this, uh, these articles and look on his blog. I will send you the uh, links in the chat. So, for the proceedings of this meeting today, um, Decolonizing the Curriculum Conference has been organized by uh, this team. So, Augustine is part of the team. Uh, there's, we also have Christina Webley, Jonathan Brooks, Ronko Oladele, and myself, Sheila Ishwardat. As I said, the meeting will be recorded, so switch off your video or your user nickname if you would like to remain anonymous. Um, so the recording will be uploaded, excluding the Q&A. Um, and it will be shared on YouTube and on our social media. And if you have any questions, please send them to me. You can see my name and uh, you can see that I wrote some of your questions. Um, and feel free to chat uh, and have any discussion in the chat but if you have a specific question for uh, today's lecture, please send it to me. We also want to affirm that we stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement in this time, uh, in this period. And we mourn all people that have been harmed or killed by racist police brutality worldwide. We refuse to stay silent in times of such injustice and we pledge to listen and expand our knowledge and this is also exactly where this conference fits in um, uh, greatly, the decolonization of knowledge. We also have some resources for you. These slides will be shared with you as well as these resources. So um, you can find them later. We have some resources for allies. We have some mental health resources as these are challenging times. So it's important to um, take care of yourself and your mental health and don't hesitate to contact any of these organizations or anyone else. And we have some decolonial resources, some um, websites, some books, which will also be shared with you. Okay, now we're over to Augustine. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Um, I think uh, you need to unshare the screen, right? Okay. Yeah, I will stop sh uh, sharing. Okay. So you're welcome to today's um, our session for decolonizing the curriculum. 
Um, the title of our presentation today is uh, Black Heritage and the Epistemic Pathways to, to Decolonizing the, the Curriculum. So, so what we've seen so far with regards to this course on decolonizing the curriculum is that uh, not just that people are presenting, having online sessions and uh, um, various offline seminars, but the discussion is all over the internet. The discussion is on social media and on all other frameworks. But I try to look at the questions that actually come up, you know, when we talk about decolonizing the curriculum. And uh, part of them is uh, the, some of the uh, queries raised with regards to whether Africans have uh, discoveries or whether colonized nations have discoveries apart from um, the whole idea of whether people want to decolonize science or mathematics and whether that is possible. And then the, 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 the tendency to believe that uh, there's a universal canon of knowledge and this canon is just, is just being questioned. And uh, that's uh, some of the things. And uh, we, we, we find comments even on the websites, on uh, uh, even in the news, we find all sorts of comments being made with the fact that they can decolonize English, they can decolonize literature, but mathematics cannot be decolonized. And then the, the all uh, discussion with regards to bringing down status and uh, cultural artifacts, some people are mixing it up with the idea of decolonizing the curriculum and thinking that uh, the, the, the people agitating or the intellectuals agitating for, for, uh, for the, this cause are more or less radicalists or people who just are expressing emotion or are bitter about the past or they just feel that they, there's a singular point of view that must be listened to and some why some people express this uh, uh, promote this cause through uh, protests we are here promoting it by uh, discussing and with the belief that people will listen to to the, the rational arguments that we are presenting and do the writing. Um, I will make reference to numerous books that uh, have uh, been published as a cause of uh, the movement and uh, some of these resources have been very useful. The edited works on how the curriculum uh, will be decolonized. The question we ask is this, what decolonizing the curriculum is not. So I want to make it clear at the beginning that it's not, we're not saying that they should get rid of books uh, written by white men or we, neither are we calling anybody evil or immoral. Uh, we are not anti-European anti uh, propaganda or promoting the propaganda. Uh, we're not doing this out of a feeling of alienation. We're not protesting. And uh, this is not a movement that claims that science or mathematics or engineering is a racist. So those who are trying to twist the whole thing in order to divert attention from the main uh, issue, they can find something else to do. What we are saying is this. The colonizing the curriculum is a call for the elimination of intellectual framework that promotes superiority of race, color, gender, culture or that promote theories, ideas, and all forms of uh, visual representations that, 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 prom that still try to uh, allow people to express some things that fueled colonial era. And uh, we are also calling for inclusion of other point of view. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I, I approach the, 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 the issue from the epistemological part, point of view. Epistemology meaning uh, what we know, how do we know what we know, and uh, whether other parts of the world can actually claim to have knowledge, which we can actually include in the, in the curriculum. And for my own manifesto, I would say that I believe that the injustice perpetrated towards uh, colored people emanates from certain historical and uh, epistemological antecedents engraved in our academic curriculum. And uh, we can address this by 
uh, including the wealth of ideas and knowledge system from those parts of the world. Now, with regards to Eurocentric narratives, um, you will still, you, you will still, you know, be surprised to find out that the Eurocentric narrative that was given to, to promote colonialism is still being promoted through various channels in our society, media, education, and all of this. And I will just try to go through what I consider as the, the narrative. The, according to the narrative, the colonized people have no infrastructure before the European came to the rescue. The colonized people were stuck naked or they were illiterate or uh, they have no form of education, not any form or knowledge. And that's what's until the way. And then the colonized people were barbaric because they were eating dogs, which some people see as pets, or they were eating some form of things, which is strange. And they were considered to be primitive, no morality, conscience, or religion. And that they had no clothes, uh, shoes, and, uh, and um, uncultured and untutored people. And uh, we must give them an organized society and teach them to be human. So the colonized people became uh, white, men's, uh, white men's burden. And uh, what do we do? Uh, we gave them education. We gave them religion and morality. Um, we actually got rid of archaic structures and institutions. And uh, we have them to process their, their natural resources. And uh, we gave them or uh, they requested for uh, independence. And this narrative is not just being promoted by books that were written in the past, but we still see in the contemporary online repositories. And uh, we still realize that the narrative uh, is still going on. And people are suffering from that because uh, some people, for the black people, uh, whether black British, black Americans, or black people in Germany or all over the globe, they actually have their ancestors coming from Africa. And if the, the African heritage is actually being called out in this negative way, and um, it's been presented in this derogatory manner, even in our contemporary era, that we actually, the incidents of racism and some people seeing them as less human. Now, let's look at a counter narrative. Um, our curriculum teaches little about uh, kingdoms of Africa, especially great kingdoms of sub saharan African such as the Kingdom of Kush, the Kingdom of Azum, the land of Put, the Mali Empire, the Songa Empire, the mystery of uh, Zimbabwe Kingdom, of which little is known anyway. And uh, one of the most interesting things that, that has happened recently uh, was the commission given to Zainab Badawi, uh, the historian, and uh, who was commissioned with, uh, by UNESCO to actually allow Africans to tell their history uh, so, so that we can have a version of history of Africa by Africans. And you can see this online. I actually mine discussions that are taking place on the YouTube. I mine it to form uh, a corpus and also mine discussions that are taking place around the colonizing the curriculum. And this corpus, you're going to, you play with them or you think with them later on during this uh, session. So let's look at the counter narrative, which has been promoted in literature prior to even uh, this era in which Africans are called to, to tell their history. Um, we have uh, the Songa Empire, and which you can watch. We have on the resources, we have a lot of books that will tell you about that, the Great Zimbabwe Empire, the Tunisia Empire, and uh, the Kingdom of Ghana, the Azum Empire, the Songa Empire, the Mali Empire, the Mosi Kingdom, the Ethiopian Empire, the Great Bini Kingdom, and the, most importantly, uh, the history around Masa Musa's wealth of knowledge, ideas, and, um, and even before the 15th century, we find out that the, 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 the Western depiction of religion, of uh, science, of technology and discourse actually made reference to Africa and black people were not just being excluded from history or being presented in a derogatory manner. 
but, but we, as we can see in the manger, that's actually from 15th century Spain. Uh, you can see among the three white men that actually visited uh, 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 Jesus in the manger, there was a black man among the white men. And then we can see the saints in the Catholic Church, uh, the, which we know that so uh, Alice and Morris. So we know that that's earlier in the 15th century. And we'll talk about the Library of Alexandra, which is a kind of uh, the center of knowledge in which a lot of people actually come from, what we call it, from, from, from Greece, from Rome to come and study there. So you wonder why the history of ideas actually uh, pull those things up and actually want to uh, give a kind of uh, a narration that will exclude certain group of people and the wealth of knowledge. What I can for this is what I would refer to as years of epistemic injustice. And that in the 15th century, you will see that not just that certain ideology, uh, ideologies were being promoted with a med using science as medium philosophy and all other frameworks to actually fuel slavery, colonialism, and the co current day imperialism. But we found that Neolithic revolution, agricultural revolution, green revolution, methodological revolution, these are part of uh, that Africans were part of, and many other part of the continents were actually experiencing this before the interruption. And then people begin to ask questions, where are the great dis uh, discoveries from Africa? But I would say that more times or the era in which they're supposed to be coming up with those discoveries, they are actually being held in sh chains, or they, they, they have actually been uh, 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 being uh, constrained, or some people have actually conspired by referring to, uh, by, by calling them subhuman, or using some I ideas to actually present them as, uh, as people that have no cultural or intellectual heritage, and that makes them liable uh, to exploitation. Um, I, will make, I will always make reference to the fact that when I give this kind of uh, talk, that it's not just uh, Africa or nations in Africa you know, that were colonized. India actually suffered that. You can see the passing from and from British to Portuguese to Dutch, and that continues. And then Portuguese actually left India in 1961. We have Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Burma, uh, Austria, New Zealand. All of them have uh, the history of being colonized by um, some other nations or powerful nations uh, in the world, Britain, France, Germany, and, and uh, the whole discussion moves on. And we, we, had a, we always try to look at the issue of idea and ask the fundamental question. If uh, it was actually true that that Africans and some other parts of the world have their own forms of knowledge and also have wealth of intellectual ideas prior to the, to the 15th century. Why were they excluded from the history of ideas in the West? And this chart that I actually present when we studied, like I studied philosophy in Nigeria, and uh, I was actually uh, made to explore the history of ideas. So I have to study uh, the Greek and Roman philosophers, uh, the Italian philosophers, uh, the German, uh, the English philosophers and study. But my education was also balanced with uh, other thinkers and other literatures that actually emerged from Africa after uh, the colonialism. And uh, if, we, if, if the question that, I, that people have been posing to me uh, several times that where is Africa in the history of ideas. I would say that why, uh, while other people were thinking and coming up with things, uh, Africans uh, were being held in chain and uh, we can see how they were shared. The, the countries in Africa, uh, the, the, those countries were shared by uh, this powerful nations and their resources exploited and their forms of knowledge education, uh, politics, everything were actually destroyed. But that will not end the narrative. It's also to 
while I was studying philosophy, part of the things that I was exposed to, which are still in the great giants uh, of uh, scholarship in the discipline, as their expression or their, their presentation of Africans. And you can see that in David Hume's work and the inquiry concerning human understanding. You will see that he say, uh, from the quotation as here, you will see that he says that I'm apt to suspect that the Negroes and in general, all of the other species of men, for there are four or five different kinds to be naturally inferior to the whites. They, they never, there never was a civilized nation of any other complexion than white, nor even any individual eminent either in action or speculation, no ingenious manufacturers among them, no arts, no sciences. On the other hand, the most rude and barbarous of the whites, such as the Asian Germans, the present Tatars, have still something eminent about them in their value, forms of government, or some other particular, such as uniform and constant difference, could not happen in so many countries and ages. If nature had not made an original distinction, uh, between these breeds of men, not to mention our colonies, there are no, there are Negro slaves dispersed all over Europe, of which none ever discovered any symptoms of ingenuity. The low people without education, which start up among us and distinguish themselves in every profession, and on and on. But if you look at this quotation, you find that that's that sounds like something you see here uh, uh, from the lips of a lot of people and even commentators when they talk about the black people in diaspora. And then you look at scholars like Hegel, who, who is my favorite uh, scholar uh, when I was taught in philosophy, what is all consciousness and the, the idealism. And I, it was also part of what he wrote that African has no history and did not contribute to anything that my kind enjoyed. And you see a lot of people still echoing that. Uh, you, there are a lot of other quotations which you can also read. And the, the, the people that actually, uh, we can say that actually cr create what we can say, a, a form of scholarship or a, an intellectual field that seems to look at Africa as subjects or, of study or objects to to be observing uh, the anthropologists and, the, and the, 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 some of the sociologists that actually, and we can see from, from uh, Levi Bruce's work on primitive uh, mentality, uh, we are actually group people like the other uh, scholars and try to present the Africans as uh, unscientific, uncritical, and uh, most of their claims to be, and to be actually illogical you know, or irrational. In, to put it in other other way, so you we see where uh, intellectual frameworks and how comes from Africa. Why some people feel it cannot be included in the curriculum is, a, is because they feel that those uh, intellectual uh, products actually uh, falls within mythological, emotional, or religious, or at most non-rational. But they may not fulfill what we con consider scientific in the sense of, of the West. And I would say that the, the idea of science as a paradigm of rationality, which they actually referring to Western science, was something promoted in the, in the Enlightenment, during the period, Enlightenment period. And I would say that's actually part of, of the agenda to, to suppress uh, intellectual legacy that actually can, uh, emanate from colonized uh, nation and you see that the Enlightenment scholars uh, ended up contradicting themselves because in the, in the philosophy of science, uh, science uh, other people have seen that most of all this idea of creating a foundation of knowledge in which other uh, claims that could be regarded to as knowledge need to be built upon, uh, it's actually erroneous. The knowledge is not something that you just feel that one one particular worldview covers all other point of, of, of or other point of views. And this takes us to, to the whole idea of African worldview, which I would say that 
that in, in, a, in an attempt to decolonize the curriculum, we, we, we will get a lot of resources from Africa. Uh, and the African worldview uh, does not only promote humanistic science and technology, but prior to African encounter with other continents, African were not in scientific or technological stagnation. And I've already proved this uh, through some of the uh, 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 edifices, artifacts, and all sort of uh, cultural uh, heritage that were, that were in existence uh, before the 15th century. So where are we going? The repair of African-centered epistemologies. Currently, most nations in Africa are, the, uh, are already working on going, uh, tapping from the wealth of knowledge that existed prior to, to colonial uh, invasion. And we, as we know, the knowledge is power and knowledge is ideological. No, no knowledge products are fully in an absolute sense. And uh, the collective intellectual capabilities have been undermined to facilitate job subjugation and marginalization. And we should not just focus on Western perspective of the world. So I will end this fourth session here so that we can also reflect on all the frameworks that can help us in decolonizing the curriculum. Thank you very much. Is that my cue? I believe that's the first section done. So now it's the first break. Um, so Augustine's asked me to um, sort this section out. Just I've got two things I'd like to ask you to do. The first thing is quite simple, quite straightforward. If you turn your attention to the comment section and just find my name, I. I've dropped two links to two different but related polls. If you could please click on the link. And the code for the, the slide, I'm not sure if you know how to use Slido, but if you use the code below the links. And um, as we can see, the, the Jones explained to us about the corpus that was actually developed. The question we asked ourselves was, um, um, what are people talking about when they, they talk about uh, Africa and when people talk about uh, decolonizing the curriculum? So we look at all the videos on YouTube, or about 95 as listed in our, uh, the Google document that was shared. So we try to uh, extract, mind the comments that people were uh, typing and the people put there, and from the mining, we came up with 3.5 million uh, words, and the comment was used to develop the corpus, and it's from the corpus that we generate this particular uh, word cloud. Uh, we're not saying this, the comments from people as a kind of uh, 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 data that can prove a point, but we're saying that it can give us in a visual form what people are actually talking about or what people are discussing when they talk about decolonizing the curriculum. And we can see in a, in a very unique way, the, the world people are so a little bit uh, dominant. And uh, we can see black and white. And uh, we, we see science, we see Africa, we see racism, man. But the bottom line is we're talking about people and the need not to exclude certain people or certain group of uh, human race from the understanding of human person. As human person that cannot just make a work of art, that are not just good in dancing and singing, that are not just good in, um, in um, uh, other forms of entertainment or any stuff, but that are also uh, good intellectually and that actually uh, have, uh, have the ancestors uh, uh, presenting to them or inheriting a large wealth of intellectual heritage. 
secondly, uh, the second thing I observed was the, the usage of the word black. And you can see this from the word tree generated from that word cloud. And you will see that certain things are still being associated to, to, to the word black. You can look at the context from your own point of view. And then when we talk about white, you will see that it's also like some people are actually saying stupid white and some people expressing, some people still using. So when we look at the, the, the what we can say, uh, uh, sentiment analysis, we found that, that the old discourse of knowledge of uh, decolonizing the curriculum, some people are taking it to a kind of white and black thing instead of looking at it from the human race. And it's going a little bit in a way that uh, it's not uh, it's a little, not uh, supposed to be. It's dirty, as I can say, it's dirty. And um, some people are asking that we need to decolonize the, the internet. And uh, we need to ensure that uh, people, when they search for certain words, as you will see from the survey, we ask you what you know about some other part of the world and where do you learn them from? We realize that most of those things are actually on the internet. And some people actually promote content or we can say, as uh, 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 some scholars have argued, that the algorithm, even in digital technology, seems to even promote some of those uh, colonial ideologies. And um, uh, there's a, uh, a particular caption here that I feel that you know we need to reflect, you know, on, which is says once the internet colonizes your brain, it can never be decolonized. So you find that the, the, the form of colonialism that uh, the ancestors, our ancestors actually witnessed was uh, a form of spatial, a form of uh, human being moving to another place, part of the world to, to go and suppress the, their, their heritage. But what we have now is uh, a form of colonialism through the internet and the representation of, of certain group of people in, in a positive and some other people in a negative light. There was something that funny that happened during this um, uh, Corona era, the COVID era, which I think we, we, we can also reflect uh, on as we talk about epistemic uh, uh, pathway towards the colonizing the curriculum, as the discovery of COVID-19 uh, COVID cure, uh, Madagascar uh, said they have found a cure. And that looks like the, 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 the joke of the of the of the 20, 2020 because a lot of people were just were just laughing at the whole stuff but i was shocked to see that the economists would present it in this way that uh, some african politician is spreading covid 19 through quackery and um, they talk about most follow the signs but some have turned to abs or prayer and if you if you if you if you, if you flash back to the, the point i raised during the fourth session about how the, the ideas are being categorized into mythological, uh, emotional, uh, religious, um, rational, and scientific. And how anything that comes from Africa uh, is often associated with the category of spiritualism or myth or miracle and trying to, and I see this as a form of a new me a, a way to to actually discredit that they have uh, people who can observe nature who can come up with uh, scientific discoveries and cure that can actually be beneficial to the global community and i will say i'm not endorsing the cure from madagascar neither am i endorsing any other cure from from any other point until maybe that we say the valid scientific community or the, 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 the scientific community endorses a particular medication, it cannot be uh, taken as uh, a cure or cannot have a universal relevance. I don't know what the word universal would mean there. But I'll point to the fact that the, 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 the old idea of herbal medicine, orthopedic and psychic healing are actually uh, scientific from another point of view and from the so-called uh, the framework of understanding science because if we understand science as uh, observation or first of all coming up with a hypothesis 
observing, experimenting, and, and trying to look at what comes out at the end of the day, coming up with theories. I will tell you that as a matter of fact, it's not something that can be be peculiar. And I will say that maybe it would be good at a point for us to actually look at where out of ideas that come from other places and see whether we can listen to others and also see, we can say whether it's argue, whether it's valid or not and test them. Uh, I will also make reference to, to some books that, that they're actually not incorporated a little bit and that I have done survey to actually see whether people have actually read them. These are, these, these are books by authors that actually uh, gave opinion that are contrary to, to the colonial representation and as well as to the uh, depiction of African cultural inter and intellectual heritage. And I will see that some of these books needs to be included in the curriculum and there's need to, to actually uh, get some people to teach them so that a lot of people can, can be disoriented from the idea that African had no history, no science, and uh, no other form of knowledge prior to the uh, colonial era. I've um, also um, benefited a lot from, from reading works like uh, literature written by Carter G. Woodson, and I've taken a quotation from the introductory part of his work on the miseducation of the Negro, that's Washington. But we can say this referred to the case of black and white segregation in America, but we can learn something also from here. Uh, it says, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his action. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. It will find its proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. It will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, it will cut one for a special benefit. Its education makes it necessary. And you know, looking at this, I would say that the, 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 the statistics and studies will always show that uh, Blacks in Britain, Blacks in America, uh, American Blacks in other places in diaspora, they, they are always performing very poor and that they are not doing well and that um, they're not doing well in some discipline. And, and to agree this extent, this, the explanation that I will give to that will have to do with when you sit down in the class and um, you just find out that no reference to your ancestors and it's like your ancestors were just smoking or just inside a bush running after a monkey or running after a gorilla while other people are thinking. And that gives some kind of inferiority complex that says a lot of things and that makes some people to, to actually uh, feel a sense of not belonging. Well, the story of Czech Antetiope also inspired me uh, with his research in Europe in 1955 and his argument about the African origin of, of civilization. And now his uh, project was a little bit discredited and I publish it as a book. And um, today we, we are quite, we are still debating it, but some people do not even open it to debate to actually correct some of the points he has actually raised in some in his, in his works. Um, the whole idea of bloody objectivism, which Katal, as I've made, uh, I quoted from, actually uh, discussed in, in particular, it made reference to, to the need to listen to other epistemological uh, frameworks. Um, <laughs> we see a lot of, uh, of things online trying to capture what really happened to, to Africa and what happened to some of the colonies. And some people want to justify that by making reference to what is currently going on in Africa. That is, it, is it no Africa that war is still going on in Africa. People are still hungry. The education sector is bad and all kind of presentation in the media. But the motive behind some of all this representation could actually be traced to what Bas Davidson actually uh, presented in his work when he captured uh, a comment from one of the African uh, Ethiopian emperor. When you look at the whole process of from slavery to, 
to missionary to uh, traders to cannon and bombardment of all those structures. Can we still insinuate that there are some existing framework and structures that are actually promoting the agenda that are actually going on? I'm not, uh, uh, the, the quotation from this Ethiopian imperial can actually help you to actually say something or have insight to whatever is going on. Uh, one of my favorite books, uh, uh, Modimbe's book on the, the invention of, of Africa, he actually uh, made it clear that the, the reality from Africa has been distorted by Western interpreters as well as African analysts. So we, we can't just say, like we talk about slavery and people will talk about slavery. When you talk about slavery, when, when it's not the black people selling black people. And we talk about colonialism. We we'll talk about, was it not your chiefs that are conniving with the colonial masters and trying to benefit themselves while the majority suffer? And uh, so he tried to present it also in another way from the epistemic point of view too, that there are also scholars from Africa who have started reflecting and themselves in the negative way, in the way that have been that they are actually being depicted in the literature. And and he said that the, the African analysts who often use categories and conceptual systems to analyze some of those uh, African reality. And he argued that the framework often used depend on Western epistemological order and thus uh, presents those thoughts as irrational. And uh, and that takes us to to other works. Oh, that's, that, that have actually been essential for us to, to see this epistemic struggle. Uh, we ask the question that uh, whether you have seen some of these books and uh, when you were doing mathematics, whether they actually made reference to the fact that some of all these uh, 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 mathematical theories and frameworks actually have their, their origin from Africa. So someone should not ask me that um, your ancestor, they don't have mathematics or uh, decolonizing the curriculum as a kind of an agenda that's one to think that uh, math and science is, is racist. And uh, we look at um, some other literature and books and um, look at geometry and computational knowledge. Uh, I have a website uh, which I designed, which I called uh, African uh, www.paintmeblack.com. And here I try to promote the whole idea of uh, African art as not just being um, scientific, as not just being aesthetics. Like a lot of people travel to Africa, oh, what a nice work of art when we talk about all those uh, sculptures and all those stuffs. But they are also, they are also rational and they have uh, some form of computational knowledge that is actually behind them. And Ron English has actually argued for that, talking about some forms of, of, of computation algorithms that are built on African fractures. And you can also consult that for your own good. With regards to mining and civilization, uh, mining civilization and knowledge in architecture, uh, I would say that African uh, intellectual heritage, you know, has contributed so much in, from that angle uh, from you can see the edifices that we have in the in the in the pre-colonial era, and you see like the the those structures in those great empires. They were not just something emotional or something irrational. They just like as anybody built, and most of this you can say, yeah, it was oral tradition. They didn't write anything down, but even Plato condemned the idea of writing and the whole printing. Uh, the idea of printing and multiplication of, 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 of knowledge in, in, uh, in a written form actually was boosted in 15th century uh, when the uh, printing press was, was invented. So we, we, we have a lot of books and that can actually be inculcated and included in the, in the curriculum. And we are not saying that this will replace existing one, but we're saying uh, it would be good for you to listen to other point of view. Talking about race, we need to talk about race. Yeah, we need to talk about it and we need not to shy away from it. We need, not, we, we need to talk about it not by looking at the victor and the victim. It's not an emotional thing. Oh, we have been treated bad. Oh, or 
No, we didn't treat anybody bad. Anyway, in all the, even in Africa, we have accounts of incidents that have happened that certain group of people have treated other people bad in history too. So we are not talking about rewriting history, but we are talking about including other points of view and making the younger generation or even children yet unborn to actually know the truth so that they will not continue to perpetuate those kind of uh, racist attitude and all sorts of epistemic injustice and other forms of, 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 uh, of discrimination that black people experience in, in diaspora. <laughs> when you tell me like the survey that you, we have done, uh, part of the question is where are you learning what you know about Africa from or what you know about India, what you know about other places from, I will tell you, maybe you can ask the people themselves. So when you want to know about the black people, uh, or the black race, maybe you can ask the black people themselves. But don't be surprised that some black people might have been brainwashed and uh, you can see contradictions. So if you've been, maybe you can start by decolonizing your mind first. And if you have not read some of all these books, that will be so good so that you can have a kind of uh, a productive discussion when you are talking about race. And uh, we want diversity. We want we want humanity to, to be one, and we want everybody to be represented in, in the positive way and as they have through various media, not just educational media, uh, the media and uh, every other sector. So thank you very much. It's been a good time. Sheila? I'm sorry, I was still on mute. Thank you very much, Augustine, for this presentation. And uh, as I already said in the chat, we will share the presentation with you, as well as the resources that I showed you in the beginning and um, um, the recording of this uh, talk. So now it's time for the Q&A. So please send me your questions. Um, it's great to see all of you uh, here. If anyone would like to answer, be, um, ask a question in person, we would very much like to encourage that. So please raise your hand um, so we can continue this session in a more interactive way. If anyone has a question, raise your hand or send me your question through the chat. Okay, so I have a question here from Maya Bidouf. And um, so Augustine, would you like to answer on that? She's asking, sure. with the curriculum being already quite packed with a lot of things, how can we have time to fit in more? S between brackets, a controversial comments that she often sees other people express. What do you think about it? Yeah, we, 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 can, we, we have what we call general studies. So you, if someone is taught in history, philosophy, and some other disciplines in the, in the humanities, we say there's no problem of uh, taking courses that has to do with that. But people studying um, uh, science or uh, technology and uh, or people in engineering, they can take elective courses or compulsory courses that will actually help people to, to know all the people as we're living in a multicultural uh, society. So it's, we can say this is just so much. We have a lot to, 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 to learn, but this is also very important for us to actually put an end to, to what we are currently witnessing. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I, th I have also heard this, um, these kinds of comments before, if we would uh, include anything outside of the Eurocentric curriculum, we would be overwhelmed. 
then, well, I would say just admit that your curriculum is Eurocentric instead of pretending that it's universal or make it universal and include more. So I have a next question from Christina. Um, she's asking, what do you suggest is the best way forward for black people who may themselves be brainwashed? Yeah, um, the way forward is uh, what we say, decolonizing your mind. And uh, school is not just a place, the only place where you learn. Uh, you can learn from other places. Uh, you can learn within the community. You can learn through or having some other frameworks like these to actually educate yourself. You can, in your free time, instead of just reading uh, some you, books that are not necessary, you can try to take some of all these not, novels and literature we have made reference to, and you can start reading them. And that will really help you when you are having discussion with other people. You will not just be angry. You will not just be, be able to provide some kind of good premises for your for your conclusion. So I would say that you can do it also on your own. Um, uh, at home, we actually, most the, 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 our curriculum is 50-50. We learn a lot from, from other parts of the world so that we can be relevant in other parts of the world. So in literature, you will study uh, British literature, you will study uh, uh, Francophone, uh, French literature, and we also study uh, literatures that were written by, by the indigenous people. And now we say that you can start with that too. Thank you. Thank you, Augustine. We have another question from Manisha. Um, uh, the question is, what steps can be taken to promote real change in the curriculum uh, and how we are thought? Yeah, to, to promote real change in the curriculum takes us back to, to the whole idea of, of, of um, bringing people from uh, different uh, backgrounds into the university, allowing diversity, not just for any other reason, but for the sake of diversity, so that we can be able to have, when you are having a particular debate, you have lecturers, who will look at it from the, the Indian point of view, from the literatures from India, in which the culture from which he can interpret it or she can interpret. Because interpretation too is problematic. Uh, when people take some of all these literary texts or even or do sociological research or African studies, and they actually find out that some of the concepts that are used are actually uh, built within the ontology that is the way of life of the people. So if you are not really part of the way of life of the people, to do a good interpretation is problematic. And that's why for the, for, to take a bold step towards decolonizing the curriculum, it's not like people are begging for a job, but it's also for the good of everyone that we have to diversify the, the lecturers. We have to ensure that we bring people from various backgrounds who can authoritatively uh, give course and do courses that are actually um, uh, engraved within their own worldview and uh, ontology. Thank you. Yes, thank you. On top of that, we will also share um, the resources with you. You will find some interesting books. Also, the books that Augustine had in his presentation will be listed there. Um, so, yeah, books are a great way to start. And there are also some um, reports um, about steps to decolonize, for example, medicine or how to decolonize primary, secondary education, um, how to decolonize the university. So there are lots of resources uh, that will be shared. Uh, we have a next uh, question from Stella. Uh, what can students uh, look out for within institutions like universities in particular um, to best hold them to account? I don't understand that, please. Can you? So, uh, what can students best look out for within institutions such as universities um, to hold them accountable? Yeah. Uh, for colonization, I guess, or coloniality. Holding the university accountable oh, for colonialism. Yeah, maybe key maybe. points. Is that a point that the person is raising? Stella, <laughs> if you would like. Um, 
Perhaps you would like to ask your question on the video? Yeah, hold on one second. Yes, nice. Hello. Hi, um, yeah, so my question uh, was basically looking at institutions that might not necessarily realize, um, you know, what they're delivering to students. So what can students specifically be looking out for? Uh, whether that's within what they're studying or the way that um, they're sort of treated in order to be to be able to say yes this is wrong and basically hold um, universities into account for that because sometimes students might not know they're experiencing something so how can they realize that themselves um, what are some of the tools that they can sort of use or steps that they can take to be able to tell yeah um, in response to that the university is, is, is what, what we can say is a universe of ideas. And uh, if, if, if a particular lecturer uh, is taking a singular point of view, if you are aware of other points of view that are written down, that are in books, you can actually call uh, the person's uh, attention to that too. Um, I will make, in, to respond to your question appropriately, I will use the case of what happened in, in USA. Uh, after um, uh, slavery has been, been actually uh, stopped after the 13th uh, uh, and the, the law against slavery, the schools were still teaching them things to actually keep them mentally uh, enslaved. But a lot of people started challenging that. And you will see that, you, you can see that a lot of young people talked about what they are not being taught in the school and how they actually bring that forward. There was a video clip I watched uh, one of the, uh, the TED, uh, TEDx talk of uh, uh, a black American talking about the daughter coming home and saying that, that oh, they say that, uh, uh, what's the name of this, this woman that did not sit from the, that refused to, that they said she refused to actually sit up. Rosa Parks. Yeah. So they said she was tired and she was, um, so that was what the girl was told in school that she was tired and she refused to stand up and she was sitting in white people's place. And but the father actually said he, co he corrected that and he told the student the proper thing and gave the, the, the daughter the read book and the daughter returned to the school and told the teacher and the teacher said, oh, I'm sorry about that. And the teacher actually uh, made the effect the change by coming in front of the students to actually uh, correct the narrative. So mm -hmm. I believe that there are polite way to hold people accountable for, for uh, positions that are actually being hidden to promote certain ideology, but it should be done in a polite way. Um, if we look at the survey that we, we did for this program, you will see that when we ask people that, you know, most of the thing, like if we, if we take it backward, like I'm saying, oh, I'm sharing that, right? Uh, we look at the pool, you see that people make reference to teachers have been very, uh, they have been the one, most of the thing they learn about other people and that they associate to black people and people of colors were actually the obtained from teachers. And what were they actually teaching them? You can see only 9%, the 9 percentage of the people were actually be able to say they actually taught them African civilization or African empire, 7% for African empire. And most of the world they talk about is transatlantic slave trade. Uh, I will tell you, when they, 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 they was in our Institute of African and Diaspora Studies in the University of Lagos, Nigeria, there was a time that a group of black students came from a university in the US to come and uh, do two weeks of retracing their roots. And we were to organize sessions for them. And, you know, being the part of the facilitators, I, I started by showing them videos of slavery, like the roots and all those numerous movies. But when I started with a particular a video clip, they just, one of the students tapped me and said, please stop that, stop that, we're not interested. Because no one is, is interested in hearing and seeing how the chain and the hold your ancestors, you are still like, it makes you, it reflects you. You see yourself being held in chain. And then you can't realize that most of, like you can see the survey showing, 66% you know, of the people who attended to this survey actually shows that what we are just seeing everywhere is trans transatlantic slave trade, which actually shouldn't be. You should actually 
equate that with African civilization, Egyptian history, you know, or even colonialism. And that's why, you know, people are responding and part of what people are doing, part of what we are doing with decolonizing the curriculum is also to actually hold uh, people, institutions, and society accountable for some of others. The Torch Survey, if you look at the Torch Survey, you will see what is, which of the following disciplines do you think African countries have made most significant contribution? And honestly, from the survey, it's just, you can see it yourself. It's hard, you know, even not just people of a particular race or color, it's virtually most people believe that when we talk about science, when we talk about technology and all these things, we are not talking about Africa or people of African descent. Then how will you, how will people not underestimate students who are taking those courses? How will you not underestimate research and outputs that even emanate from a continent with regards to that? And that's what we what we're really talking about. I hope that really addressed the, that question. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Augustine. We have another, we have a few questions uh, coming in. Um, we have a question from Morgan. Um, in the coming academic year, learning is going to be split between in-person and online. So what are your thoughts on what students and staff need to make, um, need to do to make sure that decolonizing the curriculum and teaching happens in both spaces? Uh, before I pass the question on to you, uh, Augustine, I just want, want to say we had a lecture about this um, new learning and technological learning last week. You will find it online on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So yeah, obviously, what do you think about it? Yeah, uh, online learning, um, you know, learning through uh, the medium of technology as a, as a form of the intermediary between the student and uh, the teacher, it's something that we can say has own advantage and disadvantages. But when people talk about to black students, I would not say it's just to black students or uh, to India or to Asian students or to, but it's going to be, um, it's, for me, I see it as being positive um, to help students to actually um, challenge a kind of uh, uh, a, uh, a monolithic epistemic framework. Uh, what do I mean by that? I, when I was teaching philosophy in Dominican University, um, the students were, were, were actually allowed to have their computers in front of them. And when I start teaching, when I say something that is not like I was, I was talking about uh, the medieval philosophers, and I was talking about uh, uh, Don Scotus and uh, uh, John Scotus Regina, and I think I mixed that up in the course of teaching, but unknown to me, the students are actually online too, trying to confirm everything that I'm saying. And that's one of the major things that it more or less, it, it, it helps you to actually, while the teacher is teaching, you can actually verify, you can actually have access to a lot of things, you can actually make use of, and it can actually facilitate. So I would see it as more or less uh, decolonizing the curriculum will so much be uh, important for institution if education has to go online, because a lot of people will face lecturers and instructors will be challenged uh, as students explore all other positivities and um, view all other opinions from, from valid sources available online. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are another two questions there about uh, how to decolonize uh, the library, and the other one is how to decolonize the university. Um, for uh, all of these questions about uh, how to decolonize specific subjects, how to uh, decolonize specific spaces, really make sure to check out the re <coughs> sorry to check out the resources uh, on the list that we will send to you. There are lots of resources, and um, not just uh, read this book and uh, then you're fine, but really step-by-step -step, um, explanations of how something has been colonized and how to decolonize it. Um, I think the most important part in 
synchronizing it, that you have to do something actively um, to achieve um, actual decronization. Um, I think you asked a question with regards to library and yeah. um, how the library uh, comes into play. Yes. Um, I really appreciate the effort made by our university, uh, University of Birmingham, to actually do what we can say, include some repository and also to include some books um, uh, in the shelf in order to get more literature into the book, into the library. But this, if you look at the, what we say we call a uh, book trial, shelf trial, what it was called during the, the session, um, it was the, it's actually a democratic process that it followed. So there is a form that you need to fill online and the form, in the form you have to say uh, whether how, how many people would the book be beneficial to. If you're a teacher or you're a lecturer, you have to mention certain number of students that it will, and I feel that <laughs> where there are, we are minorities, such kind of democratic process of determining whether books we enter the library or not, it's, it's obviously <laughs> a fake, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because a lot of people, the, 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 the percentage will actually lead to some couples, some repository not being included because the people will say yes to certain couples are more. So we're not saying following the democratic process of including books in the library would not be the ideal way of, of decolonizing, of uh, including. That's the best ways to make the resources available. Um, unknown to some people, there are classical literatures, more than 2,500. If you check online, you will see that, that were written, novels that were written between uh, 1980 to, to, to 2000 by, 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 by Africans. You know, so many of them, and you study like you ask a student in English literature, have you read this, have you read that, have you read that, and you, to your surprise, you find out. The person, they say, well, how can I get that? And you tell the plot, you just narrate the plot, and this is so interesting. I think I want to read that too. So, in as much as, as people may not know whether to vote or not to vote for certain books being included, if they are made available, it will encourage a lot of people to, 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 to have access to them. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so we have the next question is, do you think intersectionality could be a tool for decolonizing the curriculum and research? I would be interested to hear your thoughts on the idea of intersectionality in this discussion. Oh. I don't know whether the person who is asking the question can actually explain what the person meant by inter. Richard. So Richard, you. would you like to come yeah. online? Hi. Hi. Um, I think this is just, uh, firstly, thank you so much for this lecture. It was absolutely insightful. Um, this is just coming from the point of view, not, not so much even the curriculum, but I think the discourse that's happening right now, everyone is talking about even in terms of the Black Lives Matters movement that we need to see intersectionality with other movements and you know that kind of foster solidarity and this is the kind of work that if you yourself are an educationist, which I am an educational researcher, try and think about how your subject could be made more diverse and what kind of intersectional pathways lie there with respect to what's happening around that. So I don't know if that makes it more clear. So for example, racial justice, how is that tied into the idea of climate justice? How is that tied into the idea of justice based on gender and sexuality and those kind of things? So I don't know if that's a little bit clearer. Yeah, I've not um, actually explored literature with regards to, to intersectionality. Um, but I will, I will try to, to, to actually say that decolonizing the curriculum is not a form of fighting for a group of race. Neither is it a kind of a battle for a particular uh, people with sexual, a particular sexual orientation or a particular gender. Um, it's, it's more or less a kind of undoing the evil of colonialism. That is the, the basic thing. 
and if, if certain form of epistemology has actually been colored by the colonialist scientific philosophical uh, economic outlook we are trying to say those things could be could, could actually uh, be corrected by bringing diversity into the literature that is being studied um, so i would not like to comment on something outside this cause of knowledge uh, move to issue of race and others uh, because it will take uh, take us from the from the the, the, the topic at hand. So thank you. Yeah, I would like to say something about the intersectionality part because I'm using that also in my research. Um, I think it's it's very compatible decolonial theory and intersectional theory, and this is also mentioned by uh, decolonial theorists that. Um, we are uh, living or we are having an um, intersection or we are having different kinds of oppression that we can ex uh, experience at the same time as well as different dominations. Um, and they recognize this. So they are saying the colonial um, complex or coloniality is a mix of race and patriarchy and uh, transphobia and gayphobia etc etc um, but it's uh, um, of course it's, it's difficult to combine it but it's uh, important to recognize it i've also sent uh, someone asked ask us the links for our social media pages so i've shared um, these in the chat please check them out uh, let's go on to the next question lisa is asking uh, many academics themselves teach the theories and thoughts to the students that they themselves were taught, white European, between brackets. Um, due to this, they themselves don't know a wider range of work. Um, what advice would you give them in how to locate a wider range of work for their own subject areas? Um, in the course of this, in the, in, there's, there's something that is, is actually going on now. Uh, the scholars uh, in the diaspora uh, they are trying to uh, compile uh, a sort of anthology of uh, list of books and put that into disciplines that scholars in various fields can actually uh, include in their own uh, field. And some of this, you look at MLA, which is a, a, a modern language association, actually sends a part of compilation of such kind of a, a list. And in this presentation too, and other presentation within the series of decolonizing the curriculum, we have also been uh, compiling and sending lists of, of, of literature across the continent, uh, which can actually be, be included. And I would say that, that the, 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 the politics of publication too, uh, as to also is also what we can say part of epistemic injustice. If, 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 the team for conferences or team for, for, for chapters and book or call for publication actually allow the, 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 the product of research that are coming from other parts of the continent to, feel, to fit into to the framework. There will also be publications within journals and resources that are available that is not just from some, the, some part of the continent. And then you can realize that when it comes to publications and uh, call for paper and uh, it's, it's like some forms of knowledge or some form of ideology are being filtered out. And how will scholars within that particular field or discipline have access to what uh, other scholars in other parts of the world are thinking about? So that part, part of the thing to, to actually uh, look into publication, look into resources and also encourage uh, people attending conferences outside uh, uh, Europe or outside uh, of the Western nations alone, but but allowing some kind of of listening to to perspective uh, from other part of the world. Like as as a scholar coming from from uh, uh, Nigeria, my first publication to be able to uh, succeed in academic line in Nigeria was actually uh, published by Padre Mac, uh, Macmillan. Uh, in, in 2015. And it's because it's composed with, before you can begin to lecture, 
they want you to actually publish into, to have international publication. And that's a norm in Africa. It's also a norm in some other part of, 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 of the world. But maybe we can also make it a norm to, to in such a way that people can actually have publication, which means for me to publish in Europe means I'm versatile with this course in my field that is going on in Europe. And it's also necessary for people to also be versatile in this course and to listen to whatever is going on in other parts. So if you are in a particular field, encourage uh, conferences that accommodate opinions and publication that, co that comes from other parts of the world. And that's a good way towards decommunizing the curriculum. Thank you, Augustine. We have a question about this survey. Um, Nuruddin is noting that this, uh, it's interesting from the survey result that the memory on African civilization is very low compared to the memory of, on slavery. Does this also affect the decolonization effort? Because we do not have enough imagination about non-Western civilization. Uh, I will encourage the person to actually look at the, 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 the Google documents that that, we, that was posted by John at the beginning of this uh, uh, seminar to actually look at some of the videos that um, under uh, Zainab um, to, to be able to actually learn about African civilization. UNESCO sponsored this the project and the BBC actually ensured that they actually screened and filtered uh, the, the, the outcome of the project of trying to listen to narratives because the descendants of uh, those people that built those empires are still alive. And uh, in, that, in that documentary and that research, she actually consulted them and met them and you will see how they talk about this. And uh, it's so interesting. I developed a, a corpus from discussion around that. And a lot of people within that corpus, people that are, that are not from, 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 from the continent or people who were born outside the continent, they started commenting that, oh, I wish I've known this so many years ago. I wish I've been educated on this. And I will enjoy you to actually go to this collection and watch some of all this. And it's, it's very interesting. And it's going to change your outlook. Uh, recently, you will see a lot of people, uh, Black Americans, returning, visiting Africa. And in the course of their visitation, like uh, one lady told me when she visited, ah, well, we're told all our lives that you people sold us. And we were told that you people, you know, you people are just kidnapping people and doing all sorts of things. And, and to, to the amazement, to the person's amazement, it was just realized that it's contrary. What the person see in the media is not, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's a different thing entirely. And, and that is what one of the things that is also important that you also try to also search for those positive things. If you go to YouTube now and type Africa, you see the first thing that comes up would be, uh, people are naked and dancing. Maybe the South African people are dancing and we say the African Heritage Festival. It's just like, you just see all sorts of things. And someone told me, oh, I met a friend. And the person said, I have a documentary about Africa. You may like it. And the person gave me animal documentary. And uh, the person has so many animal documentary and that's the person's idea of animal. We have the, we have the white animals and, and all other things. And I think that's why Maybe some people associate being white, being uh, violent, and all the stuff uh, to, to people of African descent. And these things can be corrected um, using those resources. Yes, thanks. It's time. Yes, I see it's time. And uh, I also see an interesting discussion coming up about intersectionality. Alice made a, um, a point that uh, we should remember that intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw and it should not be taken out of the context uh, she, um, of what she said. And uh, that this article was actually about black women. Um, so yeah, that's a, indeed a very important point to remember where this theory is coming from and uh, also uh, to consider if we are going to apply that somewhere else. Um, I think we can close on this note. Um, as I see, there are no other questions. 
Well, again, as I said, the recording will be shared with you, the resources will be shared with you, and the presentation. I want to thank, um, yeah, you can, uh, Augustine is um, saying we can, of course, continue this discussion online, and we are looking uh, forward really to uh, discussing um, all these things with you because uh, these lectures have been very uh, interesting and fruitful. We have had uh, very interesting discussions till now. So it would be great to continue this uh, further. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Augustine, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Lots of information. Um, we've learned a lot. Um, yes, thank you everyone for being here and I wish you a very good rest of the day and evening.